Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the planet. Uh, welcome to World Endangered Writing Day. And one of the issues that we've been talking about um, already many times is the question, what is writing anyway? And actually the whole notion of writing and endangerment are curiously connected because the more a form of communication is not like what we in the West think of writing, the more endangered it may be. And we've also been talking about how the definition of writing uh, could stand being a great deal more elastic and, uh, and embracing, and that how we really don't even have the terminology to talk about um, some of these issues that we're bringing up. So to give you an example, this is one of my carvings. This is actually um, a sort of a representation of a sand narrative from Vanuatu in the Pacific. So what happens there is um, the storyteller makes a series of points in the sand with a fingertip and then starts telling a story and as he does so, he starts tracing what is literally the storyline um, in the sand with a fingertip. And as the story has its twists and turns, so the finger has its twists and turns. And the story ends back where it began, just like any good story does, except that it's taken the uh, listener on a journey and has the listener has been sort of affected by it. So this is um, a narrative device. It's also a stylized sea turtle. Um, and so we raise the question, you know, is it writing? Is it art? Is it performance? And um, so consequently, let me just put that down without dropping it. Um, so consequently, we're asking that question, you know, what is writing in, in many, many different ways. And our next guest um, is one of the world's leading researchers into Kipu. So this is something that um, many of you are familiar with. It's an Andean tradition of encoding information, if I can put it that way, uh, with knots in, in fabric or string. And for quite some time, this was sort of dismissed as a kind of um, soft abacus. Um, and the more um, our guest has been researching into Kipu, the more interesting and complex they become. So it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sabine Highland, who is at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and is going to be um, kind of really confusing you by her thick Scottish accent um, as, as she talks. So Sabine, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Um, and thank you for all the work that you've done to make this day happen and for your vision. Um, I'd also like to thank Oscar Betancourt for his technical wizardry. I'd like to thank the patrons of Endangered Alphabets and especially those of you in the audience who've come to listen to us today. Now, um, Oscar, if you could get my slideshow going. Fantastic. Okay. So kipus. The knotted and colored quartz that are the subject of my talk today are seen as the quintessential aspect of the ancient South American civilization known as the Incas. And while Inca quipus are well known, it's not generally understood that the quipu tradition in the Andes lived on for many centuries after the Spanish conquest of the Inca empire in 1532. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've done in the last 20 years where I've had the incredibly good fortune to work in some very remote corners of the Andean highlands, finding communities that have preserved examples of post Inca Kipu traditions. Such traditions can provide essential insights into how Kipus functioned as a total social fact, bringing together knowledge, memory, history, gender, kinship, and relationships with non-human beings, both animal and divine. And yes, I'm sorry if you were looking forward to a Scottish accent. <laughs> Apologize for disappointing you. <clears throat> in July 2015, crammed into a crowded minivan, my husband Bill and I drove into the mountains thousands of feet above the coastal capital of Lima. After hours of dust clouds and hairpin turns, 
Our destination appeared below, the remote village of San Juan de Coliata in the Peruvian Andes. It's a scattering of adobe houses with, at that time, no running water, no sewage, and electricity for only a couple of homes. The several hundred inhabitants of this community speak a form of Spanish, heavily influenced by their ancestors' Quechua. Arriving at the village was like entering into another world, one that I've been fortunate enough to experience. Bill and I spent our first few hours in Coyata making formal presentations to the village officers, requesting permission to study the two rare and precious objects that the community has guarded for centuries, their kipus. After dinner, a herder named Uber Brañez Mateo brought over a colonial chest containing the quipus along with goat hide packets of 17th and 18th century manuscripts, the secret village treasure. The quipus and manuscripts were hidden at the time, they've since been moved, um, in an underground chamber in the locked colonial church. Bill and I had the honor of being the first outsiders ever allowed to see them. And so it's in a it's in a hidden underground chamber under the um, sanctuary. Over the next few days, we would learn that these multicolored kipus, each of which is just over two feet long, were narrative epistles created by local chiefs during a time of war during the Spanish colonial era. That's the tradition that's that's um, kept about them among the village elders. But that first evening, exhausted yet elated, Bill and I simply marveled at the colors of these very delicate animal fibers. Crimson, gold, indigo, green, cream, pink, and shades of brown from fawn to chocolate. There's another view of, of the different colors. And, and again, it's unusual. You know, most Inca kibus that we have are made of cotton because they were preserved on the coast where cotton is grown. And cotton doesn't retain color as well as animal fibers. So animal fiber kipus are going to be much more vibrant than cotton kipus. Okay. In the heyday of the Inca Empire, from around 1400 to 1532, there would have been hundreds of thousands of kipus in use. One of the great mysteries about the Incas is that we still have only the most rudimentary understanding of their writing system. To keep all their records, whether their accounts of tribute given or their historical narratives, the Incas used these systems of knotted and colored cords known as quipus. Early Spanish chroniclers of the Inca described the quipu and its uses. We know that they encoded economic, calendrical, and census data along with histories and missives. Yet we know relatively little about these devices, in part because virtually all the quipus in the world today are in museums and other collections with little or no provenance, okay? Today, there are about 1,300 kipus in museums and private collections around the world. Uh, my former student, Manny Medrano, has done a catalog of the kipus, and that's the number he's come up with. But no one has known how to read them. Most are thought to record numerical accounts. Accounting kipus can be identified by how the knots are tied into the cords. And so you can see here on the slide, each pendant hanging down represents a numerical quantity. And so the knots are grouped along the pendant in decimal zones, okay? With the ones at the bottom and then the highest decimal value near the top. And so that's how you can read uh, the numbers on a kipu, okay? According to Spanish chroniclers, however, who saw kipus being used, other kipus record narrative information, histories, biographies, Communications between administrators in different villages were told that in the Inca Empire, quipus were sent as letters from one leader to another. Until recently, scholars believed that the quipu tradition had died out in the Andes soon after the Spanish conquest in 1532, lingering only in the supposedly simple cords made by herders to keep track of their flocks. And this is an example of a herding quipu that was um, collected by the German anthropologist Max Ule. Um, in the Lake Titicaca area in 1893. Yet in the 1980s, the Peruvian anthropologist Arturo Ruiz Estrada discovered that villages in the tiny village of San Cristobal de Rapaz, a small community north of Coyata, had continued to make and interpret quipus into the early 20th century. And so to your left, you see the giant quipu as Ruiz found it. To your right, you see how it's preserved today. And the anthropologist Frank Solomon worked with kipu specialist Carrie Brzezine and others to clean and preserve this kipu. Okay. 
Although the inhabitants can no longer read the cords, so to speak, the fact that these kipus have been preserved in their original village context, which is incredibly rare, holds the promise of new insights because the ritual specialists retain traditions about what the kipus mean. Okay, so the ritual specialists, for example, in Rapaz have very clear ideas about what each chord means and you know why it was made and how. For the past 20 years, I've been doing fieldwork in the Andes, searching for communities whose kipu traditions have endured. In Mangas, here's Mangas, a village near Rapaz, I studied a hybrid kipu alphabetic text from the 19th century. While in Santiago de Anchucaya, I discovered that villagers used accounting kipus until the 1940s. And there, I just love this picture of the road to Anchucaya. Okay, um, you either walk or you go on horseback. That's kind of your option. I was able to interview the grandson of the last kipu expert in the village, um, Don Macias, and there is his wife, um, Musmila, and to locate three kipus from Anchucaya in the National Archaeology Museum. In another community, San Pedro de Casta, which is near Coyata, village authorities allowed me and my husband Bill to study their secret ritual manuscript, the Antablo, which describes their use of kipus in their most important annual ritual, the eight-day ceremony dedicated to clearing the, cleaning the irrigation canals, which honors the forces of fertility in the water, land, and mountains. And we were able to, we met at least one old woman who remembered them still using kipus to do all these things when she was a young girl. So the, the use of kipus and Costa died out probably in the 1950s. Okay. My motivations for this quest is a simple one, to understand how Andean peoples have used these knotted and twisted cords to communicate and record knowledge. Fulfilling the functions of writing, although traditionally kipus have not been considered as such. Scholars sometimes speak of the Inca paradox. That is, if writing is seen as essential to civilization, as is generally argued, how could the Inca empire, a state the size of the Western Roman empire at its height, with a centralized so-called socialist economy for its 18 million citizens, monumental architecture, poetry, history, a complex religious hierarchy, how could have it existed without writing? It just doesn't make sense. And my research and the research of some other scholars is beginning to change how we view Inca quipus, as you can see on this great cover um, from the New Scientist magazine, okay, the Inca codes. Okay, we thought they had no writing, we were wrong. Well, hopefully. Quipus certainly served as writing, in the pre-Columbian Andes, even if their formal characteristics, their three-dimensional tactile fibers are radically different from any other known writing system. And yes, I know there is Braille and Braille is very, very important, but all of the features of Braille signs can be represented in two dimensions, okay? It's a two-dimensional way of thinking about a three-dimensional system, but knots are different. If you know anything about knot theory, you know that the challenge of, of fully representing all facets of a 3D knot in two dimensions is actually a massive challenge. So kipus are inherently three-dimensional signs in a way that even braille, which is you know three-dimensional, is not, okay? My hope is that by deciphering as much as I can um, how kipus encoded knowledge, I can not only expand our understanding of what writing is, but I can also demonstrate the intellectual um, sophistication of the indigenous people of the Andes. The post Inca quipus that I'm working on occur in the context of nations with alphabetic writing, but I believe that these quipus retain enough pre Columbian features to help us decipher earlier Andean corded texts. So, for example, my research on the Anchukaya 20th century quipus allowed me to decipher the meaning of the two most common color patterns on kipus. Um, and these, this is something that has mystified scholars for generations, right? So the two most common color patterns are what we call color banding. That's where you have, say, you know, five cores of one color, but one color followed by, you know, five pennants of a different color and so forth. And seriation, where you have a sequence of colors repeated over and over. And nobody knew what this meant. Well, in fact, the testimony of, uh, uh, a kipu expert from Anchukaya, combined with studying the kipus and then the testimony of the grandson of the last kipu expert, allowed me to figure out what the meaning of these two colors are. In fact, color 
Kipus form hierarchies of information where lower level kipus that have like individual information have their information summarized in higher level kipus with aggregate information. The difference between color banding and seriation tells us at what level we're at in a kipu hierarchy. So color banding represents individual information at the lowest level where each band stands for a single entity, whether a person or a group. So on this particular kipu, this is a labor accounting kipu. And so each band of color represents an individual in a particular kinship group, okay? The higher, the seriation, the seriated kipus represent aggregate information from multiple lower level color banded kipus, okay? Um, and so again, and I should mention then that uh, another Kipu scholar, John Clint Daniel, um, who's uh, amazing with statistics and who worked with a database of Inca Kipus was able to demonstrate that this decipherment holds true for Inca Kipus, it's not just for modern Kipus. So anyway, I had been back to Coyata. I had been invited to Coyata by Meche Orozco, the head of the association of Coyatinos in Lima, who had heard about my Kipu research. She had seen it on a, a National Geographic special. From our first morning in Coyata, we had only 48 hours to photograph and take notes on the two Coyata Kipus and the accompanying manuscripts, a daunting task given their complexity. Each Kipu has over 200 pendant cords tied onto a primary cord. The primary cord is what we call the cord on the top that sustains the Kipu. Um, and the primer, each primary cord was almost as long as my arm. The pendants, averaging a foot in length, are divided into irregular groupings by cloth ribbons tied onto the top cord. There are no knots to represent numbers. Um, and again, the tradition of the villagers is that these are not numeric kipus, they're narrative kipus. It was clear that the Coyote kipus were unlike any of the hundreds of numerical kipus that I had seen before with a much greater range of colors. I asked Kube, oh, there's another um, picture of the cord colors. I asked Kube and Javier, who were in charge of observing me as I studied the kipus, because um, I was not obviously allowed to be alone with them. I asked them about them. Kube explained that the pendants were made of the fibers of six different Andean animals. Bicuña, deer, alpaca, llama, wanaco, and biscacha. Biscacha is a, a rodent that's common in that um, region. In some cases, the fiber was best identified by touch. So for example, well, here you can see, here's brown. So this pendant in the middle is brown deer hair. This pendant is brown wanaco fiber. And the way that you could really tell the difference between the two was by touch, because they felt completely different, okay? Even though visually they looked similar. Um, Hubert and Javier asked me to use bare hands. They made me take off my gloves out of respect to the cords. And they taught me how to feel the fine distinctions between the different types of animal fibers. They, along with others in the village, insisted that the difference in fiber was significant. Hubert even called the kipus a language of animals. And again, this is... You know, this is really interesting because, you know, there had developed this notion that Inca kipus are always made out of cotton. Um, now that we're starting to get more radiocarbon days, we're seeing that is absolutely not true. There are animal fiber kipus, and of course, animal fiber kipus not only have better colors, but they have, um, they have a lot more uh, variability in terms of feel, okay. According to the elderly men in the village, the kipus were letters that is cartas, epistles, written by local leaders during their battles on behalf of the Incas. Until a few years ago, the Kipu's existence was a closely guarded secret among the senior men who passed the responsibility for the archive to younger men when they reached maturity. In my most recent trip to Coyata in 2022, the villagers gave me a piece of pendant that had fallen off of one of the Kipu's and asked me to have it radiocarbon dated. And of course I've shared the, the dates with them. The C14 dates revealed that this kipu probably dates to the early 16th century and could not possibly have been produced after 1635. The most likely date for the kipu is between 1541 and 1599. In the first, during this period, you had a series of Inca emperors who were settled in their stronghold at Vilcabamba um, carry out a prolonged guerrilla war. So perhaps the kipus are a local expression of this. 
Um, it is possible that the quipus date to the time before the Spanish invasion, according to the radiocarbon dates. Now, the pieces of silk that are tied onto the primary cord, of course, those pieces of silk are, are post-Inca, right? They're brought by the Spanish. Um, it's possible that the silk ribbons were added to a quipu created during the Inca Empire, although I believe that given the structure, they were probably added when the quipu was made. Well, how did the Coyote quipus encode their messages? There is strong, let me go back to that. There's strong evidence that narrative quipus may have been syllabic, representing the sound of syllables. A Spanish friar named Diego de Porres. Um, who used quipus extensively in the 16th century, and who actually was in this region, um, he said that narrative quipus encoded their information by pauses and syllables. Okay, so he said that narrative quipus were syllabic. We know that some um, Bolivian quipus, um, studied by an anthropologist named Nelson Pimentel, and used by peasants in, in modern Bolivia, are syllabic. So my analysis, my full analysis, which is too detailed to go into here, suggests that the Coyote quipus may well be logosyllabic, meaning that they record their messages through a combination of phonetic and ideographic symbols. The pendants have 95 different combinations of color, fiber type, and ply direction, which seem to code for different syllables. Other logosyllabic writing systems typically have between 80 and 800 different symbols in their systems. Each quipu with a couple hundred pendants might reasonably hold about 150 words, which matches the length of Quechua letters written you know, with Spanish writing at the time. According to local tradition, the first quipu was created by the head of Coyata's leading king group, which is called an ayu, called ayuca. If you hypothesize that the first quipu was signed at the end with the lineage name ayuca, then the last three pendants, Stand, should stand for a mu ka. So this is just hypothesized. Can this hypothesized relationship help us decipher the last chords of the second kipu, right? That's the million dollar question. If we look at, okay, so if we have this, these are, this is the um, relationships we have. If we hypothesize that the ending sequence of kipu A is a yu ka, and we try to, uh, apply this to the ending sequence in kipu b, and we get the sounds a, ka, and a final unknown syllable. And that color is a golden brown, which is known regionally as paru. And if we take that name, we come up with akapar, which is the name of one of the leading lineages in the neighboring um, village, okay? So that certainly um, supports this idea. And there's other correspondences as well, um, and I'm actually working with um, AI to see if I can make more progress, but so stay tuned. Other signs seem to represent entire words or ideas. For example, villagers told me that the brush of bright red deer hair at the beginning of one of the quipus indicates that this quipu was about warfare on behalf of the Inca king. Because the Inca king, he didn't wear a crown, he wore uh, this bright red tassel, and that was the sign of kingship. The Coyote quipus are the first authentic quipus ever shown to be possibly logosyllabic. Um, now, this discovery, of course, raises a lot of questions. If these quipus are logosyllabic, were they a local phenomenon influenced by contact with Spanish writing? Or do they have far-reaching roots in the pre-Columbian Andean past? Do the other types of quipus that were used in the Central Andes until the 20th century, such as those for accounting, share features with phonetic quipus? I believe they probably do. What are the epistemological implications of a three-dimensional writing system in which the sense of touch plays as important a role as sight? And how does this expand our understanding of what writing is? And I'll be trying to answer these questions um, in the book that I'm writing. Okay. The quipus that I have studied come from a relatively circumscribed area in the Central Andes. And again, in addition to the Coyote quipus, I've analyzed the hybrid quipu alphabetic text known as quipu boards, which were once common, but are now preserved in only three places in Peru. Um, villages called Mangas, Pari, and then the city of Ayacucho. Here you can see the best preserved quipu board. This is from the village of Mangas in Ancash. My friend Rebecca, a local school teacher, found it in a chest in the village's colonial church. Um, she found it about 10 years ago when a new Italian priest arrived and asked for her help in cleaning the church 
When she asked him what to do with it, he told her to throw it away. Fortunately, she kept it. Um, here it was um, a couple of years ago, it was on display at a museum in Lima and it's now back um, in Coyata. Kipu boards were created by Catholic missionaries from the Mercedarian order in the 16th century. The use of the keep, these hybrid texts spread throughout the Andes and eventually was adopted by indigenous communities themselves without any reference to priests or church ceremonies. It would be nice if the cords recorded the names next to them, but I don't think they do. Uh, that really doesn't seem possible. The cords on the Kipu boards recorded the work that each villager did during their particular, whatever particular celebration was going on. Um, they also even encoded things like their ritual duties, their enthusiasm, their labor, um, how well they worked. Um, the interpretation of cords on the kipu boards, as in the Koyata kipus, depended in many ways as much on the sense of touch as on sight. The mangas kipu cords, who you can see up close, have three levels of texture from coarse to medium to soft, which are meaningful in their interpretations. In the village of Casta, that's the village with the entablo, that sacred text um, that used kipu boards until the 1950s, the official in charge of reading the kipu cords was the yachach, which means the ritual specialist who holds the esoteric knowledge. The signs that a yachach must read in their divination are multidimensional and have to be understood haptically as well as by sight. For example, in the secret divination ceremony performed on Sunday evening at the beginning of Costa's water festival, the Yachak interpre interprets patterns of both color and texture on maize kernels using both sight and touch. The kernels represent the ritual's functionaries, such as a very soft and tender white kernel, kapia, represents the kamachiko, if the kernel is not soft, it's not kapia. Okay, so in divination, the yachak must feel the kernels as well as visually identify their color patterns. And so the same is true of the kipu's cords on the kipu board, which, as I said, have a tripartite system of soft, medium, and rough, in addition to very complex color patterns. Okay, in the villages of Roca, Cuspon, Ticlios, and elsewhere in the mountains of Ancash, which is again in, in the north central region of Peru. The people continue to make a special type of funerary kipu to wrap on the body of the deceased, enabling his or her safe passage through the underworld. This kipu, which is much simpler than the other kipus examined here, is wrapped around the corpse's waist, and the knots must be placed with precision along the legs, knees, and feet. Funerary kipus embody narratives about life and death while providing comfort to those who mourn. When made in the proper manner, the knotted cords bestow animacy to the dead, giving their legs the ability to walk safely through the hazards of the afterlife. Although funerary kipus have been known to exist throughout the region, until my recent research in, in 2020, the only practitioner of this tradition who had ever been interviewed was this woman on your screen, Doña Gregoria Rivera Subieta, who's been called Mama Licuna from the village of Cuspon. My friend and colleague, Roberto Aldave Palacios, was one of the first to interview her, and he remained her friend for many years until she passed away. The funerary cords, as I said, are simpler than most Inca quipus. They consist of a single knotted cord up to six meters in length, comprised of black or blue and white threads. You also have funerary kipus that are um, that are red and white and all the me all the different colors have different types of meanings. And even the black and blue and the, the blue and white ones or the black and white ones have different types of ways in which they're entwined together. So you have different types of patterns, which again, have different meanings. Okay. Doña Gregoria would make the kipu during the wake when the deceased body was laid out on a table inside the home. As family and friends joined together to mourn, Mama Licuna sat in the patio and created the kipu from thread brought by relatives of the deceased. So it's very important that everyone who is mourning for the dead person brings the thread that will make the kipu, okay? When the kipu is complete, it was tied around the corpse's waist with one end of the cord going down the left leg and the other end down the right leg. There are seven knots on the kipu and with a cross on the end. 
When Doña Gregoria was asked, she would say, oh, the knots represent Catholic prayers, the Hail Mary prayer, while the cross represents the Our Father. Okay. And the kipus allow, as I said, the souls of the deceased to walk in the afterlife and overcome the obstacles and challenges they face. Its presence gives the dead the ability to negotiate all the dangers that they will encounter after death, enabling them to pass to the final resting place where they will become ancestors, machus. However, it's interesting when Doña Gregoria was asked, she would say, oh, these are Catholic prayers. That's what the knots mean. But Roberto has unpublished film footage of Doña Gregoria making a quipu that shows that she also associated each knot with a syllable or a word of an ancient Quechua song about the dead person. And she addresses the deceased person and it goes, it's a word, legs flailing about uselessly. You are becoming an ancient one, almost the one who is underneath almost really extinguished. And here at the end is the cross. This prayer was chanted in a sing-song voice while she pointed to each knot in turn. It refers to how the kipu strengthens the leg so that they will no longer be useless as the deceased is buried underneath the ground like a seed. And in the end, he's somebody who is not willing to work and is kind of good for nothing. The word that they're called like, your legs are useless. Okay, that's, that's okay. So, um, and again, there's this notion of, of the song encapsulates this notion of that the person is buried underground just like a seed. And like a seed, the person will come to life again in, in the afterlife, okay? Sprouting into their new lives as ancestors. When Mama Likuna died in 2014, it was unclear whether this tradition of funerary kipus would continue. Our research team, of course, however, with um, Roberto Dave Palacios, working in nearby villages has found that not only is the custom still present, but funerary kipus experienced a revival during the COVID era. Peru unfortunately suffered one of the world's highest per capita death rates from the disease, which hit elderly populations in the countryside especially hard. In the early days of the pandemic in Cuspon and surrounding areas, bodies were cremated quickly without any burial rites. Once people were allowed to resume holding wakes, Villagers in many communities have taken extra care to ensure that the dead are buried with their kipus. So here on your screen, you see 70-year-old Taita Hilario Paulino Idalberto, the kipu maker in the village of Ticlios. Um, and the honorary title Taitai means my father in Quechua. As a child, he learned the art of making kipus from his great-grandfather. Taita Hilario told us that the kipu empowers him to deal with his sorrow when a loved one dies. Quote, I feel so sad when I make a kipu because my relatives and my grandparents are in mourning. This, he said as he held up the kipu he had made, this helps to control my grief. And again, he is, he is amazing. He has, when he starts talking about the kipu, it's just filled with puns and, and wordplay. And there's an idea of the kipu as a metaphor for the person's life. Um, the tassels at the end, he says, are represent the clappers on the church bells that toll when the person's body is being carried to the cemetery. Now, I just have a few more minutes. I'm almost done here. Anthropologist Catherine Allen's discussion of Andean ideas about death, I think, help us to understand why the act of making a kipu can animate the dead in the afterlife and bring succor to the living. The concept of rocky, Allen explains, The concept of Rocky, R-A-K-I, is, quote, the root of words denoting separation or partition of entities that originally belong together. Separation without resolution is Rocky Rocky. And that is the metaphor for death in the Andes. Death is the act of separating things that belong together, of tearing a child or grandparent or mother away from the interconnected web of family and friends forever. Quote, Rocky is comparable to the process of separating the yarns of applied thread, a complex whole being decomposed into its constituent parts, end quote. If death is understood as the unwinding of threads that were once plied together, then we can see how the making of a kipu during the wake symbolically rectifies the dissolution of death. The different skeins of yarn that comprise the funerary kipus must be donated by the relatives of the deceased who help the kipu expert twist and bind the threads together. 
making a long black or blue and white rope or red rope or all white rope, whatever, rem uh, reminiscent of an umbilical cord. The funerary kipu is the antithesis of Rocky Rocky. And is it wrapped around the corpse? And um, Roberto, who observed the use of funerary kipus when he was a boy, and also he was the oldest of 11 siblings, and he helped um, the midwives deliver his younger brothers and sisters. So he thought about the relationship between umbilical cords and funerary kipus. And he says it's very important that one of the knots is placed over the navel. navel. Okay, so there's that link to the, the umbilicus. Okay. As it's wrapped around the corpse, the funerary kipu's interwoven threads give life and movement in the next world. Okay. There remains so much more to learn about kipus in the Andes. Another community that guards its kipu as its most precious treasure is San Cristobal de Rapaz in the high mountains, whose mysterious kipus, and there you can see the mountain peaks around Rapaz. Mysterious kipus have objects tied into the cords from tufts of raw wool to little woven dolls in 18th century clothing. Okay. The ritual specialist in Rapaz told me that each kipu cord is an annual calendar of sacred feasts held in honor of the mountain beans. So the different objects tied represent offerings. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, two weeks ago, members of a, a nearby community with a similar set of kipus have contacted me um, asking for my help in preserving them. As we learn more, about Andean kipus, we can appreciate the richness and sophistication of this unique form of communication. Post-Inca kipus, which can be studied in conjunction with the words of their creators, pre present us with the opportunity to advance inquiries into the nature of corded texts, illuminating facets of how this 3D writing may have functioned throughout its millennium of use. Kipus are not simply dusty relics of the ancient Inca past, they are a living, albeit endangered, tradition of vital importance to local Andean peoples. Thank you. Okay, that was spectacular. Um, I'll let you uh, deal with the drink there for a second so that you can uh, <laughs> moisten your throat. But one of the questions that interested me most has to do with the way in which um, Western culture has, uh, in, has kind of dedicated an increasing narrowness to our understanding of writing and the importance of how information is conveyed. So uh, I, often, I often talk about um, my own education from primary school through secondary school in England. And what is interesting is how various aspects of that education were really identified with the notion of maturity. How do you grow up? How do you become sophisticated, etc.? And so one of them, for example, is color. So when you are a kid, you do coloring, but as you grow up, you leave that behind you. And there is a sense that that kind of ascetic movement toward black and white as opposites is very much part of what you're talking about in terms of the epistemological gathering of forms of knowledge in the kipu. So in the kipu, not only do you have color being a signifier or determinant, but you also have spatial determinants, not the spacing of knots apart. You have the tactile determinant you are talking about in terms of you know degree of roughness. And it seems to me that um, by thinking in terms of, oh, I'll put it down here in black and white and defining the kind of quality of knowledge by that sort of simple um, bi binary, it's a word I use advisedly, um, uh, relationship between on and off black and white, we are really blinding ourselves to all of these other ways of conveying information. I. I don't even know what word you would use, because it's not exactly haptic, to describe the way a knot is put together. Yeah. I mean, that is a form of, um, of, of, of sort of uh, manually conveying information that is right off our chart. 
Um, and it's really sort of strikes me as being so insulting that there's been this tradition of saying they don't do things our way, therefore they're primitive. What we're actually realizing is the opposite, which is here you have a much more sophisticated range of ways of conveying information than this reductive, um, you know, binary black and white quality. That that's a great point. Um, I think you know people often ask. They're like, well, why why do people still use kibus if they could use you know alpha, alphabetic writing? It, it, people are puzzled by that, and I think it's the very multi-sensorial nature of kibus that gives them more authority in the Andes, and that has allowed them to remain so important for so long. Um, and someone asked in the in the little uh, bar underneath about different varieties of Quechua. And it's not just different varieties of Quechua, but there's, you know, there were multiple languages being spoken in the Andes, um, Hakaru, uh, Kulie, and other languages. My belief, and, you know, it's, we're still developing an understanding of how kibus have changed over time, because most kibus in collections last black provenance, um, my belief is that we're going to see a, a continuum where some kibus maybe just have at the most one or two rebuses to kind of give you an idea of what they mean. But most of what they mean is not phonetic. And then you have kibus like the one in Collada that are more fully phonetic that may just be colonial. They may be pre-Columbian. No one knows yet. And so you have a continuum there. But, you know, we always think, well, if it's phonetic, it's better. But exactly. as um, Stephen Houston has pointed out, talking about um, Mesoamerican writing, well, the more phonetic a writing system is, the smaller the group of people who can use it, because it can exactly. only be used by people who speak that language. Whereas if you have a system that's more open, then it can be, you can have a multilingual um, you know, kingdom or empire, and it's not a problem because more people can read your texts. Absolutely. In fact, I was thinking about the Adinkra symbols from, from Ghana as you were talking, where uh, one of the great advantages is you, if you have a linguistically complex area, you know, you have something that is built on a different meaning relationship. So I think the, um, the whole idea that um, we, we focus our study on speech and ways in which speech is represented is so narrow it leaves out all of the other forms of communicating between ourselves here i am using gestures for example um, and ways of creating artifacts that that carry meaning yeah yeah i agree with you completely and and like the person mentioned about materials you know, there's a quiet revolution going on in archaeology and prehistory saying, wait a minute, textiles are where it's at. They're just as important as the first tools as, you know, our, our scrapers and chippers and everything. I mean, you know, the astrophysicists are telling us that the whole universe is composed of string. Um, you know, maybe the ancient Mayans who said we just live in a giant textile, maybe they were right. And also... Um, again, this speaks to our notion of like the hierarchy of value of, 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 of information because um, we have spent several centuries um, saying paper is the thing that identifies information as being of value and it's more sophisticated than, oh, I don't know, stone or animal hide that went before. And now we're moving into a digital era, which is saying, um, no, actually, that is the most sophisticated means of communication and, and storage. And paper is now becoming old fashioned. All of them, it seems to me, are getting increasingly um, narrow and increasingly limited. And they're also creating a hierarchy of value, which says that the available materials um, and, and obviously uh, cotton by the coast, animal fabrics, animal fiber fabrics further in, you know, that's a, a, um, that is the smart way of going. If you've got those materials, that's what you want to use. And so to, um, to kind of look down on indigenous materials as being somehow, I don't know, non-platonic, um, it, 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 it doesn't surprise me that we're blinded to the value and meaning of so many um, uh, 
so many meaning systems that have been created out of those indigenous materials. Absolutely. And, and I know like other people who've spoken today, like Pippa, I mean, writing is about human relations. And so kibus have the shape they have because they're, they're public documents. You hold them up before the community, before you assign labor tasks. You, you know, read them if they're phonet if they're phonetic, you read them aloud to the other authorities in the community. They're not they're not normally meant to be just kind of like sitting in your room reading by yourself. And of course, you know, a lot of people worry about the psychological effects of our digital age where people are becoming increasingly, you know, have fewer non-virtual interactions. You know, it, it's hard to say because, it, you know, it's great. Here we are in a virtual global, you know, stage. And yet there's something concrete about actually being able to touch another person. Uh, absolutely. And this also, uh, this, the phrase that you used several times, which is, um, uh, the, I, I don't, which was in, identified the person who makes the kipu in that particular village or in that particular community. I've been thinking a lot recently about um, how writing was different when there was a writing expert in a community, either a scribe, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean specifically a religious scribe, they could also have, you know, secular purposes, or as in um, the father of the Barry brothers who created Adlam, who was the person in the village that people took their letters to, who would re then read those letters to them. So an interesting thing has happened in the process of making reading and writing pretty much universal, which is that um, the notion of writing as being something special and valuable has become diluted. And, and the, the, the kipu maker as being somebody who has um, skills and an understanding of, of this meaning, um, that's something that we've sort of lost. The, the Quechua phrase for the kipu maker is the kipu kamayoch. And kamayoch means, it doesn't just mean maker, uh, it means somebody who is able to, in a sense, infuse the essence of themselves into what they're making. Right. Um, in the villages where I work, the kipus are usually treated, except in Mangas, and now that's no longer the case, the kipus are usually treated as, as sentient beings. Um, there are offerings made that put out discreetly, you know, you'll break some cigarettes to have a tobacco offering, you'll put some coca leaves um, when you consult the kipu. Um, they're considered beings in their own right because the makers are unable to infuse them with part of who they are. That's, that is really fascinating. So, um, uh, it, as I was, as I was doing my research and writing for my book, writing beyond writing, I started thinking about Geoffrey Chaucer. Okay. So Geoffrey Chaucer was a great, great writer who lived shortly before the advent of printing. And so the way people would have experienced, uh, for example, the Canterbury Tales um, was the way in which um, Balinese tradition or Javanese tradition continues to this day, which is it's a public event. Um, and uh, they still have traditions of people uh, reciting poetry, some of which is traditional, some of which they, you know, they've read themselves. So um, I'm imagining Chaucer and he's reading the Canterbury Tales to a small group. Okay, so he didn't have a megaphone. It's like a fairly intimate thing. And what he's doing is he's doing the gestures. He's doing the accents, right? All of the different characters. He's, he's kind of animating them as he's going. And um, we now look at what is the relic of the Canterbury Tales, which is just what we have in black and white. And we kind of go, isn't this a wonderful thing about writing that we still have Chaucer 600 years later? And I'm kind of going, well, that is true. But what is being preserved is only the smallest part of what that actually meant at the time and what that experience actually was. That's absolutely true. And, and, you know, and so my other work in, in like recording indigenous literatures and oral traditions, we have this idea of like, well, the correct version is the one that's published. 
<laughs> and if you know the version that's told varies well that's not quite right and of course you know that that's silly um the correct version is the one that's being told to meet the needs at the moment um yeah absolutely so it's 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 this whole business of um the 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 conversion of performance to product is really also at the heart of this debate the fact that um, one of the things, for example, I have this this um, uh, picture of this amazing Javanese illustrated or illuminated manuscript from the 19th century. And uh, there is writing and then right in the middle, there is a painting of a mermaid. Right. <laughs> and in that tradition, this was actually a poem and the poem was in different cantos and each canto had a, a different rhythm very much like a you know a piece of music having different um different tempi as you go through and the purpose of these uh, padia was to hint at the change of rhythm between one section and the next and it was indicated by uh paintings uh, you know animals birds in this case a mermaid but what i was thinking was that that manuscript was was uh, written by somebody and it was never intended to be a um, something that was mass produced. It was yeah. it was a gesture of um, it was a gift, if you like, of that person to whoever would read it. And um, and I started thinking in terms of the manuscript impulse as opposed to the creation of a product. And obviously, once you industrialize writing in the form of printing, you start thinking in terms of production and distribution and fulfillment and all those things. And more and more, you start thinking of writing as being something which has stopped. You know, it has been stopped in time. And everything that you're talking about from the public um, uh, interaction with it um, to the person kind of embodying this with their spirit is something that I think is really worth thinking about when we start thinking about the history of writing. Yeah, and that's why it matters that we wanna preserve endangered writings because when everything becomes the same, we lose so much. You know, it's one of the things that's such a joy to work on quipus is that the Andean textile tradition is so rich and there have been extraordinary scholars working on it. Um, and of course, it's inspired, the Indian textile tradition has inspired great artists like Annie Albers and Sheila Hicks and all these fiber artists because it is just so remarkable. Um, I recently saw a talk where my friend Jeffrey Splitstozer, who studies Wari kipus, that, those are the kipus that belong to the empire before the Incas, um, he was able to show how the designs on the textile actually refer to dance movements and huh. and the passage of time you know so again we're just we're just babies yes, <laughs> trying to understand yes. these textile traditions it's hard to even train yourself to look at a textile and really see what's there and and a, a kipu and not to let your eyes just kind of glaze over right especially if we've been used to thinking of fabric arts as being a form of um just elaboration or um embellishment and i remember being in guatemala where of course the textiles are just phenomenal and being told that each village has its own um tradition of of, of sort of narrative by patchwork um yeah. by fabric i'm thinking you know boy i am blind to all of this yeah yeah, yeah. Well, um, so I mean, thank you. Yes. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. There is no ugly Guatemalan textile. I can't understand that. There's no, there's no combination of what they do where you kind of go, oh, well, they missed the boat on that one. It just doesn't <laughs> exist. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to wrap this one up now um, and encourage people. Um, first of all, um, if if you have the wherewithal, we would love you to hit the donate button on our, um, our, our World uh, Endangered Writing Day page. Um, we would love to be able to do this uh, on a bigger scale. We'd love to be able to do it live. Um, and at endangeredwriting.world, you'll see a big button that says donate. We would love it if you would do that because there is so much more that we wanna do. 
Um, speaking of so much more, much of the content of um, uh, World Endangered Writing Day is actually not on these uh, live streams, but actually on our websites. And we have three that you can go to, the one we just saw the link to, plus endangeredalphabets.com and the online Atlas of Endangered Alphabets at um, endangeredalphabets.net um, and that has just been doubled in size with our second wave launch of a hundred more um, uh, minority and indigenous scripts from around the world. Um, so many of the ideas that we're talking about here um, are in my book Writing Beyond Writing um, and uh, if you're interested in that stuff I suggest you check it out. Um, so we're going to take a very short break of um, two or three minutes, and then we will continue with our next session. Thanks so much. <laughs>